One of the narratives I hear in education all the time is this idea that we need to embrace failure. And I understand the intention behind it, uh, but I really struggle with what it tells, you know, people outside of the field of education. Does it say to them that it's something that we're embracing that's finite, that, you know, we're, we're good if we have students who don't, aren't successful in our schools. And I, I don't ever want that coming out. And I think that we have to focus not on the failure part, but the getting back up. What do we do when we struggle? How do we learn from that process? How do we become better because of the, some, the things that we have, uh, you know, we've, we've gone through? And this idea is one that we talk about in this podcast today with these three incredible educators, and we'll get to them in a second. But while I was listening to them, I was thinking about this idea that I've shared about the notion of success breeds success, that when we focus on the things that we do really well and we shine a light on them, does it get more people to embrace them? Does it get more people to get excited about them? And it's not about we don't ever have any bad things happening, no negatives happen, and we don't address those things. Of course we do. But I think a lot of times our successes inspire other people to try new things as long as they know they're supported in that process. And in this podcast, uh, we talk about the idea of building the world's greatest school. And when you think of this notion of the world's greatest school, that, that means there's only one. And uh, one, of the, one of the participants today, her name is uh, Jessica Delavine. She shared, it's not about building the world's greatest school. It's about building a world's greatest school. And this idea is that what does your community need? Who are the people you serve? How do you create the best experience possible for the people that you are closest to? And I think every one of us in the world has that capacity, but it takes a lot of uh, understanding who the people are that we serve, really kind of building values and, and thinking of the big picture ideas and, uh, that we, we connect with. And the small stuff is something we can negotiate, but the things that connect us are the things that are really, really important. We have to make sure that we're all on the same page. This is an amazing podcast. I loved connecting with these three incredible educators and you're gonna love their stories, what they have to share. And welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I got something a little bit different today. Something, uh, you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting, but hey, we're all here today. So instead of having just one person on the podcast, not even just two, I got three people on the podcast. Today. This is a, this is a uh, innovator, Innovators Mindset Podcast first, three people on the podcast at the same time. So hopefully this the, all the, the technology works and we're all good to go. But um, we have Richard Parkos here who actually wrote the book, Building the World's Greatest High School. And uh, and we talked about this when we did the Three Questions podcast. It's not just high school specific, right? And I think, you know, we can obviously talk about, you know, great teaching is great teaching, you know, from kindergarten until you're, you're 100 years old. And so that's something I think is, is something that we have to kind of talk about. Uh, but Scott Cavanius and Jessica Delavine, uh, also here today, and they're they're uh, they're co-administrators. Scott is the principal. Jessica is the assistant principal, newly appointed within her own school. Which is pretty cool, <laughs> right? So so uh, so it's great because I know there's a connection between you two. So or between the three of you, um, between the two screens, I guess. And so um, we're gonna actually. I, I'm gonna start with Richard. Uh, Richard, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, some of the work that you've done in education, and and what you're doing today? Well, uh, you can tell I've been around a while. Um, I spent uh, 25 years in the schoolhouse as a, a teacher, coach, activities director, administrator, left and uh, worked as a consultant um, for about uh, 18 years and, um, and then evolved into what I'm doing now. But um, during that time I, uh, of the consulting, I... Um, I visited over 2000 schools. And so there were things when I walk into schools and I would, I, I would come across things that would just tear your heart out what was happening to kids. And then others you just walk away where they went, wow, I can't believe what happened. So I tried to uh, consolidate all of those experiences and put them into this book called building the world's greatest high school. And um, it, it my my intent was to try to simplify this complex organization we called school, because every place I went into, 
um, there was a culture that existed. There was an organizational structure that existed. And we, I tried to say, uh, it's confusing. It's confusing kids. It's confusing mm -hmm. teachers. So we tried to simplify some things. And then um, we started with building uh, six, six um, values and beliefs. And that's where the connection came with Scott and Jessica as we, we took that journey and uh, started implementing that in a couple of schools. So there's, there's a couple of things I want, I want to ask you about. Well, actually, the first one I just want to make a comment on. The, the, I think that taking the complex and making it simple is a sign of great leadership. The adverse, I've seen people take the simple and make it complex. And so <laughs> if I'm listening to you and I have to you know, get out a dictionary then we got problems, right? Like this is like, and I think that's more of an ego thing than it is actually like, let's help, you know, move people forward too. So uh, that's something I really appreciate you saying that because that's, you know, I, I think a lot of the ideas that I share, you know, people are like, right, yeah, that, that totally makes sense, right? But they might not have thought about it uh, because you're like looking at all these different things. So I'm going to ask you this question, Richard, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, so you go into Scott and Jessica, you've been into a ton of schools. What's what do you see there when when you do this? And like I, I already know it's good. This isn't like a surprise intervention. <laughs> no, I already know it's awesome. But like what, like for the people listening, you know, what, what do you see when you go into you know Scott and Jessica's school and and you see what their team's well, doing? What sticks out to? It's um, there's a combination of things that I see when I walk on that campus. And, and first of all, it's a magical place for both kids and teachers. Uh, the interaction, um, I, I had an opportunity to, you know, stay connected with their staff during the pandemic. And I know that a lot of people were struggling and there were struggles there, don't get me wrong, but they, they had it together. In other words, when they said, okay, we're going virtual, we're going to do this. And, and there was this togetherness to where everybody reached out and supported one another. And it all revolved around their, what you see on the wall behind Jess and, um, and Scott, their values and beliefs. And so I saw a lot of schools that struggle go, oh my gosh, what do we do? And at this place, the teachers and the administrators said, okay, we're just gonna go with honor and we're gonna take our beliefs and values um, and, and, and put those into action. Um, seeing the kids um, in action was, well, there was a young man, I'll tell you, um, I, I was so moved by this. Uh, he was a selective mute. And because his experiences prior uh, in his elementary experience he was never spoke. Mm -hmm. But then um, because of the environment and the opportunity for kids to be the world's greatest version of themselves, that's one of their beliefs, um, is that this young man, just he, this transformation that occurred was just absolutely phenomenal because of the environment and the culture that allowed these kids to blossom. And the whole idea that, that everyone is gifted and talented. Mm -hmm. Everyone at the school and the kids believe that, the staff believes that, the parents believe that. Um, it just... The student voice, I was was there watching a panel of students talking to the, uh, the staff and talking to the teachers about how they learn best mm -hmm. and what they do when they struggle. And I had never seen an opportunity where a student panel was giving feedback to teachers on their instruction. And I just walked out of there going... Oh my gosh. And nobody was offended because a lot of times as educators, when kids say, Hey, you do this, you do that. We get offended by that. It, it was open. And the teachers took that, um, the empowerment, the connectedness, the sense of belonging, the sense of pride, um, uh, uh, across the board. And, and that exists in schools, but this is at a whole nother level the depth of those connections, the engagement, the belief, uh, the concern of teachers and staff. Um, it, it's a magical place. And like I said, I have not been on very many campuses mm -hmm. where I see this occurring. The, 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 the thing that I, I think is really important, this is something I, I've been really advocating for is 
I, this is going to be controversial. I've said it before. I don't think every kid can be good at math. I just don't. And mm -hmm. partly I believe that because I don't think every kid cares enough to be good at math. Right. So like, if you don't want to be a good basketball player, there's no chance you're probably going to be a good basketball player. Right. And like, and there's, you know, obviously exceptions to that rule, but I think, you know, helping kids figure out their own gifts, even if they aren't within like, here's what the subjects are. Right. And like, kind of thinking about that. I think that's something that we have to like constantly talk about because a lot of times we don't see a kid as gifted because they're not good at what we have predetermined are the things that we're doing. But, you know, it is partly some of the challenge in education is saying like, yeah, we do have to teach this. How do we help bring out that kid's gifts in a subject area that they might not really care about? Like I always say this, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at science and I, I will never be good at science, nor do I care. I think science is really important. I think, you know, especially now, right. I think science is something that people need to pay, but there's better people for that. Whereas I have gifts in, in different areas. And so Jessica, I'm going to go to you next here and kind of talk about this and something that Richard said, and you were, you, you worked there at the school where you, you were instructional coach. Is that correct? Is that yeah. what the, and, yeah, and so were you a teacher there as well? You were instructional well, coach? You're instructional coach, and then you were now you're assistant principal. So I'm yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here. So you see those those words behind you, right? And a lot of times schools have these awesome vision statements, or they yeah. have these like really good things. Nobody knows what you're talking about because somebody did that for them ten years ago, and it's just like something you walk by and don't pay attention to. So in your experience in that school, in different roles. Like, how do you see your your school living that, like living those words that are behind you? I, I love that question because it's something that um, that we're blown away by every single day. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'm starting my fifth year here. Um, I did four years here as your instructional coach. Um, and still every single day I walk out and I'm like, oh, my gosh, how right. did we see another example of that? And so. Alvarado is, I mean, Park used the word magical. Um, I might be a little biased, but right. honestly, this is this is a place where those words just, they don't just stay on the wall. You see them in action. And um, as instructional coach, the the charge, the the daily drive, the um, the push every single day, every single class period, every single minute of the of the school day um, was to have to, to be able to design, create learning experiences for our kids where all, everything, the pedagogy, the, the environment, the supports, the strategies, everything was driven by those honor values and the shared right. belief. And so we saw, we saw teachers taking the time to not only establish connections and relationships and, you know, obviously learn about the kids, but then take that into be, becoming more of a responsive educator, right? And right. so in, in doing that, in designing responsive instruction, we got to see how all of these honor values were right. embedded in strategies that we saw every single day. And I think that the impact there is that when you have these kids in front of you and they see themselves in the instruction and they see themselves in the content mm -hmm. and they see how you know, their strengths are being amplified and their areas where there's opportunity to grow, um, where those areas are being supported, you get the feeling that you belong. Mm -hmm. You start to believe and understand that you belong in that classroom, that you that you that there's a connection with the teacher and your peers um, for a reason. Right. And mm -hmm. so that sense of belonging, um, what we say at Alvarado is that we empower others to explore greatness. Mm -hmm. You see that beginning to spread. Um, and I, I really, I mean, the, the instructional design, that's, that's, it's a, it's conversation that we hear in the hallways and it just like fills my <laughs> educator soul. So I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, so go, go ahead, Richard. Thank you for asking that question because, um, I've been in a lot of those schools where right. uh, I refer to it as artwork on the wall. What you see behind oh, them yeah. is, is that you walk down the hallway and, and we say, well, what are you doing? Um, to deal with character situations. Well, it's over there on the wall. And so it, it's like we have, when there's a need for an intervention, we say, oh yeah, see there, it's over there. The difference here is, is the staff develop this. 
Mm -hmm. And they, when it was messy work, when you start getting and asking people about their values and beliefs, I mean, just take a look at what's going on in our country right now. And I don't mean to be political with that, but mm -hmm. there's two distinct sides and there's this argument going on. And that sometimes happens within school communities. And what you see behind there is that the staff developed this. Right. And they're now living this on a daily basis into where Jessica has developed something called belief driven learning to where the learning takes place by by the honors, uh, the honor statements, as well as um, as their beliefs and values of what they do daily. So it's it's pretty special what they've put together with this. So this is actually what you said is is really important to me. And um, when I, I wrote uh, Innovate Inside the Box with Katie Novak, who's a brilliant, brilliant mind, and we shared like, hey, here's like four big. Well, that's the innovator's mindset. That's the that's the predecessor, right? But hey, <laughs> shout out to both books, right? So there there's actually something here, and I, I and I I had the opportunity to to speak uh, to your staff, and I don't know if you remember this. I don't tell anyone how to teach. I don't, I don't do that. That's not my role. I talk about learning quite a bit. I talk about some things, but ultimately at the end of the day, I'm like, you need to figure out your own path. That's the goal, right? Cause I don't know your community. That's your job to know your community. Right. And so in innovating at the box, we actually talked about like four big ideas, but I actually outright say you have to define what this looks like in your school. You have to show like, how is this measured? How do we know we're doing this? And then when that staff has more accountability because they created the path, then you're going to have a way better school. But some guy from Canada telling you this is how you'll be successful. I've never been to your school, right? Uh, that, that doesn't work. And we do that way too often. Someone outside of your organization defines what makes your organization as opposed to we got to figure this out yourself. Uh, when you were sharing something, Jessica, I, I wanted to, I, something popped up in my mind. It's pretty positive, to be honest with you. Um, I, I mean, I'm, put, I'm putting on my dad hat right now. So it, when I talk to... Uh, you know, when I think of talking about administrators, this is my rule for my kids for, and this is my expectation. And you, you, you kind of made me feel like this would be the place, right? Is that do not put my kid in any classroom. You wouldn't put your own kid in. That's Absolutely. it. And if you, and, it, and if, and if you do, and I find, and it happens, I'm, we're going to have a talk. Like, like if you wouldn't put your own kid in there, don't put my kid in there too. I know it's like a harsh thing to say. But like, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair thing that like every parent is like, you know, and it doesn't mean like every kid and every teacher is going to get along. It doesn't mean the teacher's bad because like I, I've had conflict of, you know, personalities with students and they just work better with other teachers. I understand that as well. But that expectation. And so, uh, Scott, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you. I, I actually uh, we were kind of talking before um, about how it's sometimes uh, strange when uh, someone goes up in the own school. I actually, if I had the Darth Vader theme music, I would have played that. <laughs> because sometimes it's like, oh, Jessica's on the dark side because she was like, you know, she worked and now she's assistant principal, right? And so you have this. And I made a joke that, you know, you know, maybe Jessica, and you, like, I saw a little anger in you. You're like, you know, I wouldn't be here either. And you knew, you were like a little upset. So uh, obviously you were adamant that, you know, Jessica was there. So what did you see uh, in the work in in and this is like this is gonna be like the 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 jessica love podcast coming up right now here <laughs> like well hopefully. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to sign off i'm gonna have to sign <laughs> off. yeah right <laughs> like what did, what did you see in jessica that would actually help you know not only you as a principal but you know as your, your school like what did you see because obviously the thing that jessica is saying about your staff finding those strengths you see that in in jessica so like what what was it that you know you, you were like adamant like jessica is the person to to be a part of this this team so I, this is my sixth year, started here five years ago. Um, and uh, me and, and, and our assistant principal at the time, um, her name is Danielle Villa now, um, we started together. Um, we were both appointed at, at Alvarado. Um, I came from an outside district. She was um, inside the district. Um, she gave five amazing years here and we had the best team ever. Um, and she just recently became appointed to principal at a school in the district. Um, <clears throat> and so, I kind of went into, okay, what's next mode, right? And um, I wasn't sure if Jessica was was ready, uh, if she was ready, right? I, I knew that she, she, she was ready to do it. I didn't know, she has a couple young kids. 
Um, she's super dedicated to her family and also loved the role that she was in. So I wasn't sure um, if she was um, ready herself. I knew she was prepared. I don't know if she was ready to, right. to, um, to, to make the move. Um, and so here's the funny thing. When we talk about the, the teachers and the dark side and all that other stuff, mm -hmm. our teachers made the push. Our teachers were part of the interview process. Our teachers sat with our district leaders and were like, it's got to be Jessica. And, and they, they, you know, the support and mm -hmm. everything that Jessica has given to them um, to help them become, again, what we say that like the world's greatest version of themselves. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to what you said. I don't think we've ever taught, told anybody here how they're going to teach. Um, they're the experts, right? right? They're the experts and they all have their own individual greatness. Um, and I think Jessica has always been a huge support in helping them develop their own greatness. Um, for a lot of them, um, she was our, um, I saw this on the, the show Billions once and they were referring to one of the characters on there. They said she was our, our spirit animal, right? Like she she would take people when they were broken at their, at their worst um, right. points or versions of themselves and build them back up and they came out more inspired to be better versions of themselves. That's who Jessica is. Um, and so that, that transition part was, was kind of, was weird for me and tough for me because I didn't know where she was at. Um, I spoke a lot with Danielle, like, Hey, who's next? Are we ready to go? And um, I knew that Jessica was next and she was having those, those wants to get into the, the educational leadership side. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I, when I made that comment earlier, like, well, if it wasn't her, then it wasn't going to be me either. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I, I I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I've become completely dependent on the work that I do with Jessica. You, right. you, you had mentioned how we, we take shots at each other all the time <laughs> right. in the office. Everyone knows that like, we are always looking to crack on one another, but I, be, I, th this working relationship, um, it is, it is something that never turns off. It just never turns off. And so it would have been so weird for it to not be Jessica. I wouldn't have known how to, how to move Alvarado forward anymore. And I don't think our staff would have known how to move forward anymore if it wasn't Jessica. Like that was just what it had to be. I and, and I, I want to tell you, I'm very grateful for our district leadership in, in understanding that, believing in that and trusting in that, right? Because they, it's, their, it's, it's, Jessica is theirs, right? She's not mine. She's there. She, she's mm -hmm. hired by the district and through the district, right? And so they could have made whatever determination and placement they, they wanted to do, um, but they trust in, in what we're doing here and, and they've always supported that. And we're, we're super lucky. And so it was a very, I'll never forget the day and the time when I got the call. And when I was able to share it with the staff and the emotion that we all shared together, it, it was just a beautiful That's thing. Awesome. Hey, so you know what's happening right now then? Let's get it. <laughs> Shout out Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, so, that, so the, the, the thing, uh, I think this is something a lot of great administrators have done for me. And there, there's two things I want to point out here. The first one is uh, they put me in situations to lead up, to do things that maybe I was not quite ready for because they saw that potential in me. And I think that if I wasn't given that push, I wouldn't have done them, right? And so that's awesome to do that. Uh, the other thing the other thing I wanna point out, you know, you know, shout out to your, your district staff. We were just having this conversation before, I was talking to an assistant principal literally yesterday. And he had said that there is a rule in the district, I can't remember if it was the district he's in now or was before, that basically you could not become an assistant principal uh, in your own school. And, and like, there's, I think there's pros and cons that I understand that I don't like rules like that because at the end of the day, it's like, well, you know what, we know this would be best for our school, but the rule said, and it's like, right. nah, it's stupid, right? Like if, if it's, if this is the best situation, if this is the best opportunity and, you know, staff is behind this, right. It's much easier to, you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, you know, a lot of times probably staff are, there's some comfort level with you too. And there's that little, like, what's going to happen next here. And I, there's, there's power in that too. And sometimes we need to change sometimes, but it's ultimately what's it's, I, I always say, you know, if, if, uh, if common sense, common sense trumps the rule, the rule is stupid, right? Like that, that, and that's so like when we make rules like that, it actually isn't in service of, of our people and understanding the community, you know, it could be like, Hey, we, this is not gonna be a good situation if you stay here or like, this is the best situation. 
and not to make a rule where you have to abide by that because now like we're setting a pre no you just do what's right that's it right and that's that's always the focus so hey we're, i'm gonna ask you i'm gonna ask you uh Richard. Stop pushing the button scott okay, yeah <laughs> Is that your version of the air horn? Is that yeah. <laughs> we're Love trying, it. trying to keep it going here, man. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. So we we all work in schools. It's it's all good. Hey, Richard, I'm going to ask you. Um, so you wrote a book, uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Jessica and Scott right away about the connection to this. But I just kind of it's called Building the World's Greatest High School, and you can actually see the link uh, in the description down below. So. You, you actually said that I don't want it like it's it's not limited to just building the world's greatest high school. It's actually more than that. So like, can you give us like a brief like uh, description of what the book is and what it's what it's about? Well, it it um, the genesis of it was Ayala High School in Chino Hills, where we opened a brand new school in in 1990. And there came across, um, I, I don't know where it was either. I saw a picture someplace and, and it had a hallway and through these halls past the world's greatest kids. And I thought, that's it. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to build a school, why not build the world's greatest? You know, it, it's referred to, hey, let's go to No Hope High where there's no hope for our <laughs> teachers again. So I said, you know, people, people, uh, you know, are attracted to winners you know the when when the raptors won everybody was there right okay and, you know and and yeah. and i know you have a kobe jersey i and, do uh, and Many. so you you would people identify with winners and so why not start branding that school so we started this at ayala and um where we started telling kids that they go to the world's greatest school and the transformation that started to occur over a period of time, within a couple of years, you'd ask people and say, the kids say, where do you go to school? They wouldn't say Ayala. They say, I go to the world's greatest school. And they sort of mm. puff up and go. So then you start developing, you know, who are the custodians? Who are the cafeteria right. where they're all the world's greatest? The band to this day still, they're the world's greatest high school band. Right. And it just, it, the expectations of the kids and the teachers, they started to live up to that. And so out of that, it, the, it, it's based on these six values. We are what we believe, what we believe unifies us. That's what's behind Scott. Mm -hmm. um, no one gets anywhere without a teacher. So I love your question that you asked that because I am who I am today because of a teacher yeah. and all of us on that screen. Um, all kids have futures. So if we believe that, and all kids are gifted and talented, and uh, every day is an opportunity to be the world's greatest version of myself, and everything we do, we we do with pride. And that's what we've taken out of the, the concepts that are woven into the book, and that's what we've done and built at, at Alvarado. I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be honest with you, though. No Hope High sounds like an amazing Netflix documentary. <laughs> I was like, yes, I like a title of it. Does it not? Like, oh, like I want to see No Hope High. It's like a, it's like a high school mockumentary, right? Like, so, it is a good title for a show, right? Like, I, yeah, I would is. watch that. Let's do oh, it. No Hope High. That sounds good. Hey, so, so, the, so the connection, and when we, I was actually introduced to you. I uh, was introduced to the three of you. I think it was, uh, it was a Dan. Dan Kenley. Dan Kenley. Uh, you know, Dan Kenley had no interest in coming on the podcast. He just said, you should talk to these people. So he reached out to me. Uh, and I actually was on the road and I kind of just, I didn't have time to respond to it. And I just, you know, snoozed it until I could, you know, respond and actually like make something happen. But I was like, okay, yeah, we could have all three of you. Like, I don't understand the connection between, you know, we have this person who wrote a book and we have these two people at a different school. So, so, Make Scott and Jessica make that connection. So, like, you have this book. You, you, I, I'm like the only one not calling you Park. I kind of feel left out. <laughs> I don't know if your name is Richard or if everyone's just punking me, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's this no, is like no, Canada's no, version no. of No Hope High. Yeah. Right so, so Scott and Jessica, like, what's the connection between you, you, and you and, and Park? I will lovingly call him. Yes, <laughs> please do, please do. And uh, like I said, uh, I had done work with Park in the past through kind of like the activities world and things with ASB and Renaissance and those types of those types of things. And Park's work continued. Um, and I always stayed close to his work, um, read his books, and we remained close. Um, everywhere that I went, um, I would bring Park in to speak to our students, speak to our staff, whoever it may be. Um, when I finally became principal, 
um, I always felt like something was missing in schools. I always felt like there wasn't um, a, a, a uniting type of force or something that that was unifying mm -hmm. everyone. There was all these things that were that people were doing. And there was always the like flavor of the month, right? Like there's like learning objectives, PBIS, MTSS, you know, um, whatever it may be, all these different things that were always happening, um, but nothing was ever anchoring it. Right. Um, and there was never, I never felt, you know, being a big sports fan and stuff like that, um, I, I believe a lot in identity, right? Kind of what Park's talking about right now. Um, and I always felt like schools had to have an identity. And so when I became principal, um, in both situations, I've been, this is the second school I've been at now, there were outside forces mm -hmm. that were saying, hey, um, staff is really behind. Um, you guys are a program improvement school. When I first came into Al Alvarado, we were out, actually um, had outside governance that was, um, that was overseeing the school at the time. And they wanted to talk about things like learning objectives and activities right. within the classroom and all those other things. But what my response was, we don't even know who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and so my work with that what I've done with Park, um, I started learning about things like shared beliefs and values. And I, I always said as a, as a system principal, as a teacher, like we need to know what we're about before we do anything else. Right. Um, so, but I knew that I couldn't develop that from the top down. And I knew that I couldn't just bring Park in and say, okay, guys, here's your beliefs, here's your values, go ahead, have a great school year. Mm -hmm. um, that had to be something that was um, developed by the staff, right? And developed by the students and developed by the community to have true ownership. This is not Scott Middle School, right? right. This is not Jessica Middle School or Park Middle School. This is Alvarado Intermediate School, right? So we took the learnings from Park's book um, as a guide and we also brought Park in to work with our staff to help us create the beliefs and values. And like Park said, there was a ton of wordsmithing. There was a lot of, of, of struggle. Um, it's, it's almost, it's nearly impossible to get an entire staff together for, for a full day or a full week. Right. So we had to like sub out half of the staff. We would have to ask parents to come in, students come in so we can do this work. Um, and it was creating these very simple honor values behind us. And we have four belief statements that we pulled from Parks Values. We used as, you know, I, I just said, hey, guys, read through this. Take a look. We need something like this. It doesn't have to be his exact values or beliefs, but we need something like this. Um, that work with wordsmithing and, and putting all that together took right between a year and a half to two years. Mm -hmm. And so as a principal, a new principal at a school in a new district, that was a very tough battle to, to hang on to. Um, but I knew in the long run, I shouldn't say I knew, I believed in the long run that we would get to where we're at today, to this place where we're all coming from and all operating from a shared vision, shared beliefs and values. So it's, it's so it's, you made a really good point. I am really trying to like, just kind of get my own learning out of this space too, right? A lot of times uh, we focus on like the the learning objectives, like the little things, but the big things we're not connected on, exactly. right? Whereas like the big things are actually the things that we need to connect on and the little things are the things that we need to kind of struggle with a little bit more, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Like those are the things that are a little bit more negotiable. The big things aren't. Like we gotta I, be, we gotta be on side, right? Well, and, uh, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and so to, to, yes, to, to add to that, the things we have like this concentric circle thing that we use here, the things are, are always finite, right? Those things are always changing, but those big pieces that you're talking about, our beliefs and values, those are, those are infinite, but that never changes. So everything that we do comes from our beliefs and values. And then all of those things are, are the action steps that are that are a result of our beliefs and values, if that makes sense. So when I uh, my my superintendent, when I first started as a assistant principal, principal, her name was Marilyn Campbell, and she said this to me, and I'll I'll never forget it. She said, "When you leave this school, what will your fingerprints be?" I remember that distinctly. Like, how will I know you were here? And it doesn't mean you tear down everything the person did before you, but you're you're like creating that as well. And so as I'm listening to you, 
you're, you're seeing your fingerprints like when you leave the culture the culture you're building will will last beyond that i think that's an important aspect yes. uh, one of the things that i um one of the things i i hate like like just i'm not gonna lie i despise it when like we need to embrace failure i'm like no yeah i don't want you failing with my kid you gotta you gotta be successful when it comes to my kid as and that's what every parent wants i understand the intention behind it um but i struggle with the idea but we like we are like nobody talks about like success and i think that um the idea i i've, I've said this forever success breeds success that that is something that's really important and you you made the sports analogy i remember i went to a seattle seahawks football game and i was in seattle never been there one of their things is they have like the 12th man right like that's that's a big thing like there's 11 t- players on a uh, you know on offense and defense but their their fans are right and just the culture of the city because they have built a winning organization you know that and it doesn't mean they didn't lose games didn't mean that they didn't have struggles but they always you know they they fed off of that right and seeing each other successful i think is, is really important and i'm not saying failure doesn't happen but i feel i feel like we celebrate we almost identify it as like a finite thing where really it's it's part of getting like the the failure is not the important part it's the getting back up and getting back to our values getting back to where we're at so i'm going to ask you this this question uh jessica because people are listening to this and they're thinking like okay so okay they're the world's greatest school so then there can only if there's there's only by definition there can only be one greatest school and i i obviously you know that's that's not true so how does like someone listening to this create that space where they're they're also in that in you know in that that realm as well uh, I love that question because when I, uh, I only got, Jessica, I only got good questions. <laughs> I'm learning that. I'm learning that. Um, when I, well, you're the only one who's complimenting them too. So all my questions <laughs> Scott and Park sucked. Obviously, only my Jessica, all, all my Jessica questions are nailing it right now. <laughs> um, you know, when I first uh, had the honor of joining Alvarado, uh, that threw me too until I understood that it was a world's greatest school. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, that's the, Ooh, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's the, that's the difference right there. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, establishing the identity, knowing that you're running off of shared values, core beliefs, knowing that all of those finite things are supposed to evolve as long as they're always rooted and connected in those values and beliefs. That's mm-hmm. what makes us a world's greatest school. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I, I'm going to like toot my own horn a little bit, but it's like, it's not going to be there. So I actually spoke in Ro- Roland and, uh, I got a standing ovation when I spoke there. Okay. So, so as you should have, that's, that's not the point of the story. There is, there is a point of the story. There, there is a point of the story about the standing ovation. Okay. So there in it, like a lot of people think that's all George, George came in there and what like it was like so easy i'm not no offense like like i I didn't have to be that good like it was so easy because i felt the culture was so set people were like excited to be there like i felt an energy when i walked in the room i'm like i i'm not gonna lie to you i'm like this is like this is standing ovation day today like this is happening (laughs) because you because the energy in the room was different do you do you know what i mean whereas i could tell you and it's kind of like um I know this is, you know, for a speaker, this is something I always think about. So I, I've seen a lot of comedians and they always have like a warm up comedian who like goes in there and try to get the crowd excited so that the, 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 the main person just will knock it out of the park. Right. But if the warm up person's no good, then you struggle. And it's kind of like just, just listening to Julie, your superintendent, feeling the culture, people like, like a lot of times I go into a place and it's, it's people are like, sitting in the back as far away as possible because they're like oh these days suck they're so terrible and and then it's like i'm like oh i got work to do this is gonna be this is gonna be a tough day right and so it wasn't like i i would say it's like that was like a 10 percent me thing and a 90 percent culture thing that was set up before i got there and that was what i really appreciated about it is like that culture was set up there and I was just kind of there to like reaffirm a lot of the amazing things that you're doing too. So that's a really like, that's not, and I know I've not been to your school, but it says something about your entire, uh, the culture of of your school district and yourselves and Julie, you know, leading as a team. It's something I really appreciate it. So, um, we, 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 uh, we're, we're running a little bit long here and I know, can I ask you, are you all in the same building? 
No, I swear, no. Okay, this is the weirdest thing because Jessica, I don't know, you're doing some AP stuff that you're like, Scott was like, you're the AP, you got to deal with that. <laughs> you walked out and I watched this and I just want to kind of confirm. And I saw a hand go into Richard's room <laughs> and then and then you came out. I swear, did anyone it else? Was not, it was not my hand. Uh, but like, I are did you all the same girl that you just messed with me right now? Because you were <laughs> like, you literally came in. I, I hope this is on video too. So when you see it, there was a hand and you came in. I was like, wait, are they in the same building? Is that what <laughs> so that was yeah, not that was... my hand. I promise. Okay. We're like, we're like, um, probably like 40 miles away. Yeah. Okay. So just heads up, Richard, someone's in your house. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so someone's in your house. I thought, I thought you were in the same building. Anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, um, I'm going to ask you each this, this, the same question. Uh, somebody listening to, uh, and I'm going to start with, with, uh, Park. Uh, I, someone says to you, uh, well, like, what's one thing, what's one thing that we can start on our journey? What, what advice would you give them park? Go. I think it would be to really step back and, and start with that question. What is it we do? Mm -hmm. And, and, and be, and, and don't use jargon. I, I don't like mm -hmm. jargon because a lot of it, that's the flavor of the month type thing is that um, if somebody asked me, what is it you do park and, and, and Jessica and Scott and, and the Alvarado community, as well as the Giano community in, in the Roland district, that is a world's greatest school <laughs> is um, we change lives and impact futures. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. And that's what today was about. And that was my goal. I don't know if I reached it, but that's what I was attempting to do. And that's what teachers do every day mm -hmm. is attempt to change lives and impact futures, not, not prepare kids to be college and career ready. Right. And so start with that. Um, I guess that point of asking yourself, what is it we do? is that um, it is a great place to start a conversation with staff and, and students and ask and see what their responses are because part of this process is not only the staff, but it's the kids because the kids hold the teachers accountable for right. honor. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of watching it. When the teachers get out of line or Scott gets out of line, mm -hmm. Jessica never gets out of line <laughs> is that um, they're going to, they're going to hold them accountable with honor. I love that. Jessica, what do you got? What's the um, one? To start? You know, I think it would just be to simplify. I just feel like um, I know, you know, we talked earlier about the exhaustion of an educator. Um, that exhaustion comes from all of the things that we have to focus on, all of the things that we have to juggle, right? Mm -hmm. So I think my focus would be through all of those things, through everything that I'm, uh, through every decision I'm making, through all the strategies I'm trying, through all of the, um, the actions that I'm demonstrating, what is it that I want to communicate? Um, and to really, to really dig through all of those things and, and to ask myself in doing this, what is it that I want to message to the kids in front of me? What is it that I want to message um, to, to our community? And so, yeah, it would just, it would be to, to dig and to simplify in that way. I love it. Scott, you're up. Let me start by saying this is a great question. Thank you so much for asking. Yeah. I was wondering because like Jessica didn't say anything. So I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I got to for her all the time, man, all the time. Um, so I'm going to give kind of a two part. The first one would be um, that the, the I, I use this thing all the time. The lens you choose to use will help you find what you're looking for. Like if it, it really, we have to be very intentional about which lens we choose to look through when doing this work, when looking in, at our at our students, at our staff, at our families, our communities, our co our colleagues and coworkers, um, it's our choice to decide on which lens we're going to look through mm -hmm. when interacting with all of those people and how we see them, right? And then the other part would be that we got to walk the talk, mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking about the stuff like you're saying on the on the wall and all that other stuff. If our 
if our actions do not align with our beliefs, um, then it's going to be a big mess for everyone. We cannot say one thing and do another. We cannot communicate one thing and have um, contradicting actions um, uh, to those words, right? Um, our kids and families will call us on it immediately. They will they will know it immediately, and they will respond immediately in the same way. And so it would be those two things that there's a certain lens we need to look through when when doing this work, and we got to be we got to really be about it. Okay, so I, I got I got two things to, to kind of bring this all together. So there's this quote that I'm known for, uh, this idea of make the positives allowed, the negatives are almost impossible here. And I get yep. crapped on for this quote all the time. They're like, oh, you don't think there's negatives in the world? It's like, I'm like, no, nobody's saying that. So yep. like, if you look at the last little while, there's a lot of crap that's happened in our world, you know, all this other stuff. I do not have time for people that complain about everything all the time. It's not about not addressing negatives. It's about finding a way forward. Yeah. That is what I've always advocated for. And so being very clear on this, I think part of it too is it is identifying, you know, things that are not working. It is identifying, you know, problems that we're having in our world, in our schools and, and things like that. But I we all we all know, let's pretend let's not pretend we don't. We all know people that got a problem with every single solution. No matter what you're doing, it's wrong, right? We we've all encountered that in our lives. And I just don't have time for that because I, I we need to move forward, right? Because like, as y'all said, this is about our kids, right? And the, the thing that I've always focused on, my my job is to help kids find a path to success in a way that's meaningful to them, not to define what success is. They have to figure that stuff out themselves. We, we give them the tools to do that. But the thing that I want to give as my like one thing to do uh, is based on this conversation, surround yourself with awesome people, like just being around. I, 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 have, I don't, we've never had a conversation before this. This is just like the easiest conversation. I love connecting with you all, um, and having this time. And if you make kids feel half as welcome as you made me feel today, then you have a very blessed school. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate it. So I, it tells me something about, uh, the culture, about who you are as people. So, uh, anyone who's listening, I encourage you to uh, pick up Park's uh, book, Building the World's Greatest High School, which is not high school exclusive. Park would go back and he'd cross it out if he could that part, right? So <laughs> I know you would. He told me that ahead of time. But also connect with, with, with these three amazing people. I know um, if you connect with them uh, and you'll see their links to their social media uh, down below, you will feel as energized as I am, you know, but constant on a constant basis. So just thanks for, thanks for taking the time to be here today. I had my doorbell ring. I'm like, oh, this like bell, bell ring and stuff is like, <laughs> this is on. So, uh, you know what? I'm gonna do it one more time. Shout out to all you. <laughs> so, anyways, thanks for being, uh, thanks for listening to the podcast. I, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I hope you have a wonderful day.